On May 19, 1902, the bell tower on Irvington's town hall rang out for the first time. Within were the library and reading room that the trustees of the Mental and Moral Improvement Society had insisted on when transferring the property to the village. One trustee was Charles Tiffany, the grand old man of the jewelry trade. A resident of New York City and Irvington, he died three months before the opening of the village's most important public building. His son Louis, the painter, interior designer, and glassmaker extraordinaire, had already agreed to decorate and furnish the library and reading room. And now, with funds provided by his friend and neighbor Helen Gould, he created a subdued, elegant interior featuring turtleback wall sconces, a mosaic clock and architraves, and a suite of arts and crafts furniture. Nearly 100 years later, the library moved to spacious new quarters at the foot of Main Street. But the reading room remains one of a very few intact interiors by Louis Comfort Tiffany and a prestigious asset in a village blessed by its history. In 2004, the Board of Trustees of Irvington's Library formed a committee to restore Irvington's crown jewel and reopen it to the public. The town hall interior was not the Tiffany's first contribution to the village of Irvington or the last. Charles Tiffany was a founder of the original Presbyterian Church, located across Broadway from the present building. That was in 1853, a full decade before he acquired his Irvington estate, then owned by cousin Jabez Ellis. The Broadway entrance established a tone of rusticity. Charles and his wife Harriet came to Irvington with their children Annie and Louie first as weekend guests in the early 1850s, then as renters of the Ellis estate, and finally, during the Civil War, as owner of one of the most desirable properties along the fabled Yonkers to Scarborough Millionaire's Row. From Broadway, the land dropped 160 feet to the Hudson River, affording a series of breathtaking views of the Tappan Zee. Charles bought the property together with the Dunhams, relations by marriage of his niece Charlotte Morse to James Dunham. The Tiffany's and Dunhams shared the estate until 1875 when Charles had acquired all 50 acres, which he landscaped and renamed Tiffany Park, today's Matheson Park. The Tiffany's occupied the original Revolutionary War era farmhouse built by the Dutcher family, which Charles enlarged, added to, and renamed Tiffany Hall. Charles encircled the farmhouse on three sides with a piazza that was gradually hidden behind the lush blooms of wisteria. Painter Henry Peters Gray chose this view as the backdrop for his portrait of Annie sitting on the piazza in 1867. By then, Louis was 19 and an artist himself. Roaming the fields at Irvington and the banks of the Hudson River in pursuit of subjects for his paintings. Though a New York City boy, it was at Irvington, during the waning years of the Hudson River School of Landscape Painters, that Louis had his first sustained exposure to nature. At Irvington, he effortlessly absorbed the profound sense of the organic that guided him for the rest of his life. Shortly after graduating from a military boarding school, he decided to embark on a career as a painter producing a series of memorable views of the Lower Hudson River Valley, the wharf at Yonkers, Dobbs Ferry, the Palisades, Irvington. In 1872, Louis married May Goddard of Norwich, Connecticut. They had four children, three of whom lived to adulthood. With both Louis and Annie starting families of their own, Charles acquired the Dunham share of the estate including their second empire, Fieldstone and Slate Mansions, completed in 1866. Annie and her family moved into one, and Louis and his family, the other. Inspired now by his new family, as well as by the landscape, Louis painted In the Fields of Irvington, originally titled Among the Weeds. At Irvington looks up toward the roof of Tiffany Hall, But painting merely served Louis as the springboard to a dazzling array of other media. In 1878, he went into the business of interior decoration, which led him to manufacture and retail many of the related arts, notably colored leaded glass. This window depicts a river that Tiffany knew so well, framed by hollyhocks, clematis, and trumpet vines. 
In 1867, Charles Tiffany sold part of his Broadway frontage to the Presbyterian Church, which built a new church designed by James Renwick, Jr., architect for St. Patrick's Cathedral. The results were sufficient even for such outsized personalities as Jay Gould, Cyrus Field, George Morgan, David Dowes, John Wendell, and Charles Tiffany, all local residents. But according to one parishioner, the elders skimped somewhat on the interior. That was rectified by Louis Tiffany in his final contribution to the village that shaped his artistic sensibility. His 1913 redecoration of the church interior, including replacement of all 185 windows with his eponymous glass. Rejecting all religious iconography, he created his purest expression of spirituality in diamond pattern leaded glass with abstract amber tones mingling with those of sky and sea in endless variations dictated by the sun. The highlight of Tiffany's decoration of Irvington's reading room and library in Town Hall is surely the suite of wall sconces. Amber at night, iridescent by day, these so-called turtlebacks were extraordinary to behold. The library's lighting fixtures moved with the library in 2000, but the most beautiful ones in the reading room have been removed to a place of safety where they remain. Fortunately, a renovation of Town Hall has begun, and with it, plans made to restore and reopen the Tiffany Reading Room. For this to happen, vital work has to be accomplished. The committee, headed by Library Board of Trustees President George Berger, is meeting with art historians, conservators, artisans, and others with the expertise to propose suitable treatment and help formulate a master plan. And a fundraising drive is underway, with an eye toward a grand reopening ceremony in 2005.